So hello again, and my name is Annabelle Munson. I'm your host and moderator for the Universal Business Aviation webinar and meetup. I want to welcome our new guests and welcome back my returning viewers. As I just mentioned, as I was greeting you, I did miss seeing everybody in October since we did not have a webinar, but it was truly very awesome to meet lots of you in person uh, for a change at NBAA Base that took place in Vegas just a few weeks ago. And I have to confess, I even had a few inquiries about when the infamous Christmas tree was coming back. So we're gonna have to stay tuned for that. I haven't made a decision on how long that's gonna be up. So we'll see what January brings. So uh, please stay with us for that breaking information. <laughs> All right, so from here, I'd like to go ahead and set the scene so I can bring the experts on for the real information. So uh, looking at where we're at for November, 2021. So the rules of the operational game for international travel continue to be complex, but the good news uh, that continues to emerge is that greater access is opening worldwide. So big news this week, the US opening to international travelers, continued growth of Europe traffic and private aviation demand overall in that sector, even some opening in the Asia Pacific region, we're gonna hear more about that today, and some positive signs as well for other parts of the world for some overall loosening of access. So trends that we're seeing that you're gonna hear covered today uh, in, and or touch on. Private aviation overall, as we're seeing from many sources, has the potential for a very strong 2022 as a result of pent up demand and remaining concerns out there about health, safety, and capacity issues of commercial airlines. We've seen some very dramatic examples of itinerary issues for some of the commercial carriers. Uh, access, so this is a big one. We are gonna to touch on this. The gold standard for international travel and access across the globe continues to have two essential steps in most cases. That's gonna be a valid and complete COVID vaccine plus a negative COVID test. Our experts will share the details with you shortly, but at the very top level, we're seeing no signs that testing is gonna go away even for the vaccinated. That's just the reality that appears to be the case. Um, countries, not surprisingly, are deferring to a very conservative approach for approving entry for travelers. They want to keep the flow open, but they do want to make sure they're controlling COVID numbers. So feasibility assessment for your unique trip and your unique situation, your crew, your passenger, your itinerary becomes even more essential facing this myriad of, of continued restrictions. So holiday surge, another trend, obviously seasonal. Um, I asked our team of experts to touch on this as well today for the Caribbean, Mexico, the islands, South America, Central America, we're definitely seeing trip leg bookings increase for the November, January timeframe and the need to plan ahead remains high. Uh, any of you that have been traveling recently know that resources are constrained uh, throughout the pipeline and that what used to be simple from a trip planning standpoint is not necessarily simple anymore. So feasibility planning is key. And we also have a special guest today. I'm pleased we had an excuse to invite our Canada regional expert back, Anthony Noreko, CBA president and CEO. He's going to give us the insider's perspective on the changes on tap for Canada and their access going forward. All right, so now that we've set the stage, let's get to the specific agenda and who's with us today. Christine Van Backus is going to be kicking us off with her regional review and top tips for successful trips. She's our senior account manager and operational expert. I'm happy to report Adam Hartley is back with us this month to report on the latest for the US and Mexico. He's gonna leave the Canada heavy lifting to our special guest. Adam is our manager of Global Regulatory Services team. We get to put the spotlight on Adam for the very much anticipated and happy news that the US just reopened to international travelers and he'll break that down for us today. And finally, like I just mentioned, we're gonna wrap up today's session of planned content with Anthony from the CBAA. He's going to put in perspective the changes for Canada access that are rolling out here in November and key ops reminders to smooth your planning for the region. We'll close out your day with questions as always. So we're gonna start off with Christine as we usually do. Welcome back, Christine. Thank you. And could you get us started with the Caribbean? So again, just like last time, I apologize. There's a lot to cover. Uh, so first we're gonna start with the Caribbean. Uh, the first country to mention here is the Bahamas. All vaccinated travelers looking to go to the island will need to get a COVID test within five days of arrival. Also for intra-island travel, they'll need to get a rapid antigen test. 
Then we have Barbados as of October 24th, vaccinated travelers looking to go to the island will need to get a COVID test prior to arrival. Uh, however, uh, unlike before, you can omit the on arrival COVID test and you can also omit that quarantine time. Then we have St. Vincent and Grenadines as um, of the last month, vaccinated travelers can come into the country by showing that proof of vaccination uh, and having a PCR test 72 hours prior to arrival. Health authorities do reserve the right to conduct an on-arrival COVID test. If this does take place, you will need to self-isolate at your hotel until the results are known. Uh, what's also peculiar about the, this country is that they also require PCR tests for in-transit passengers. Uh, then we have the Cayman Islands. They did announce that for November 20th, they plan on moving into that phase four of the country's reopening. As such, vaccinated travelers can come in quarantine free. It's important to note that unvaccinated travelers will not be permitted into the country. Then we have St. Martin. Uh, for vaccinated travelers looking to go to the island, they will no longer need the pre-arrival COVID test. Uh, what's also important to note here is that for crew, they will need to either show proof of vaccination or have a negative PCR test prior to arrival. Then we have Antigua. Antigua requires that uh, all travelers coming into the country five and up do get a PCR test prior to arrival. Also, the uh, additional regulation is that any passenger 18 and up will need to have received at least one of the two doses of the vaccine or complete the one dose g and vaccine. Got it. All right, then let's go ahead and go to South America for a quick review. So for South America, we've seen some openings over recent weeks. Uh, the first one is Chile. Uh, with uh, October 1st, vaccinated travelers can now enter the country. They'll they will need to show uh, proof of vaccination. They'll need to have a PCR test prior to arrival. Uh, they will need to have uh, travel medical insurance and complete an online form. They will also need to upload their vaccination and get what they refer to as a COVID green pass. Uh, upon entry, they will take another COVID test and they will need to quarantine at their hotel until those results are known. Uh, then we have Guyana. Persons looking to travel to the country will need to show proof of vaccination. Uh, this is the first country I've noticed that stipulates a time frame. Uh, they say that the vaccination has to be done within nine months of entering the country. Uh, additionally, you will need to have a PCR test prior to arrival and complete a health declaration form. Uh, then we have Argentina. As of November 1st, uh, they did advise that they are permitting vaccinated travelers coming into the country quarantine free. Uh, with that, you will have to show, of course, proof of vaccination. 14 days must have passed since your last dose. You will need to have a PCR test prior to arrival, and you will also need to take another PCR test between days five and seven. Unvaccinated travelers coming into this country, and this includes minors, they will need to complete a seven-day quarantine. Uh, they've also stipulated that as far as crew is concerned, if they are vaccinated and have their negative PCR test, they can move about freely. However, if they are not vaccinated, they'll need to have that negative PCR test and quarantine in place for the length of stay. Uh, then we have Uruguay. As of November 1st, travelers can come into the country if they show that proof of vaccination and have that PCR test prior to entry. Um, they will also need to complete a health affidavit and they will need to take a PCR test on day seven if they plan on staying beyond that time frame. Got it. All right, then let's move on to Europe. What's changed there recently? So for Europe, first country is Belgium. As of November 8th, they did advise that U.S. vaccinated passengers can come into the country by showing that proof of vaccination. Upon arrival, they will need to take a COVID test and they will need to self-isolate at their hotel room until those results are known. Uh, they will also have to take another COVID test on day five. Uh, then we have Finland. U.S. vaccinated travelers can come into the country quarantine free. Uh, border control does reserve the right to test on arrival if they, uh, if they want to. Then we have Sweden as of November 5th. Vaccinated travelers from the U.S. can come directly into the country, were previously required to stop in an interim EU country, and they no longer require a PCR test for entry. Uh, then we have Russia. As of November 9th, uh, they have issued a list of countries from which you can come into the country if um, you've been there for the preceding 14 days. The U.S. is on that list for that non-essential travel. Uh, for any traveler, vaccinated or unvaccinated, they will need to get a PCR test prior to arrival, and they will also have to have health insurance. And then last but not least for Europe, we have the U.K. Things have remained relatively the same, with a couple of small items I wanted to mention. Uh, the first is the red country list. Though currently it's empty, it's still active. 
This means that the government reserves the right to move a country back onto that list as they see fit. Um, outside of that, vaccinated travelers no longer need a pre-arrival COVID test. Uh, crew no longer need to fill out the PLF form for arrival. And last but not least, the day two testing in lieu of a PCR test, you can also now take a lateral flow test. All right. Okay. How about then the Middle East? Anything there? For the Middle East, there's one country I wanted to mention, and that is Qatar. As of October 6, they did move the U.S. to the green list, and as such, they will permit vaccinated travelers coming from that country. Of course, you will need to show that proof of vaccination, have a PCR test to come into the country, upload your vaccination documentation on an online platform, and you will also need to get a, an application that you need to download to your phone that you need to activate on arrival. And for these vaccinated passengers, it's quarantine-free entry. Got it. Okay, then finally, let's move into the Asia Pacific region. This is a region we've definitely been watching closely in the hopes of seeing more access emerge soon. What's new? So there are a few countries on the list. So these are all good signs of, of a move towards reopening the region. Uh, the first one is Nepal. As of September 24th, they are issuing visas on arrival. As such, if you are a vaccinated traveler, can show that proof of vaccination with 14 days passing since the last dose of the vaccine and have a PCR test prior to arrival, you can enter. Uh, they will also require rapid antigen tests upon entry. Uh, then we have India. As of October 15th, they are permitting foreign nationals to come into the country for tourist purposes. As such, passengers will need to get the applicable tourist visas. Uh, for all entrants, they will, as this includes crew and passengers, they will need to have a negative PCR test prior to entry. Uh, authorities upon arrival do reserve that right for that random COVID test. And everybody will also need to complete an online form, which they will need to print and carry a hard copy with them. Uh, then we have Singapore. On October 12th, authorities did announce that passengers coming from certain countries using what they referred to as a vaccine travel lane would be able to come into uh, Singapore if they're vaccinated. Uh, note that the U.S. is on that list and as of the 15th of October, uh, civil aviation does now recognize business jets as part of those approved vaccine lanes. So if you're looking to come into the country, a landing permit is needed. The lead time is seven uh, business days uh, in order to do so. Additionally, everybody 12 and up needs to be vaccinated. They will also need to take a PCR or an antigen test 48 hours prior to arrival. Upon entry, they will need to take another COVID test and they will need to self-isolate until those results are known. Uh, then we have Thailand. As of November 1st, vaccinated travelers can now enter the country quarantine-free. There are a few stipulations here, so it's a longer list. Uh, the first is show proof of vaccination 14 days since the last dose of the vaccine have a PCR test 72 hours prior to arrival, and get what they refer to as a Thai pass. And the lead time for that is seven days prior to entry. Uh, they will also need it, uh, require that you have a travel uh, medical insurance. Upon arrival, you will need to take a COVID test and you will need to self-isolate until those results are known. Uh, then we have Bangladesh. They are permitting vaccinated travelers into the country with that proof of vaccination. And of course that PCR test prior to arrival. And last but not least, we have Japan. Uh, they did announce on November 8th that passengers from certain countries may be able to come into the country, such as the US, um, from the US rather, uh, for certain essential purposes, such as business. There are a lot of stipulations in order to be able to come in. Uh, that requires that your organization and the receiving party work together to get what they refer to as a screening certificate through government authorities. With that, you will need to use that to get the appropriate visa to arrive. Uh, you will need to be vaccinated, have a PCR test prior to arrival, take another PCR test upon entry, and then they do require a three-day quarantine, at which point on the third day, you will need to take a PCR test in order to exit that quarantine. Indeed, you were not lying a lot of updates, but good news because some of that is, are indeed areas we've been waiting to hear more news on. Just complex, but we can get in. So excellent news there. 
Um, and that's another good reminder, not that you have to keep all of that top of mind. Uh, unlike our expert, Christine, this information, as many updates as possible, go into our weekly update as well as on our blog. So look for those as resources. So Christine, I understand you have some top tips uh, to share on the subject of peak season travel for popular holiday and warm weather destinations, especially for that November uh, through January timeframe that we were just discussing. So that includes you know, the, the Caribbean, uh, Mexico, South America, Central America. Um, I've got an update on what's new, in fact, uh, from some of our UA locations in those regions, all related to this topic. You know, as a whole, it's clear that our UA locations worldwide are ramping up not only for the holiday surge, but also the overall increase in traffic that's projected for 2022. So in particular to the peak seasonal traffic, Christine, I heard from the team at Universal Aviation in Costa Rica this week. They've been preparing for months for the seasonal surge coming up uh, now that the country is not only a private aviation popular destination, but also an emerging yacht destination. That's really been an increase for them. And we also have seen recently from UA news on expansion in the Dominican. Um, so back to popular destinations for the season, we've expanded coverage there into six international airports. So more to your point. So on that note, can you give us some overall tips on what to expect and how to handle the season ahead? Um, I think the tips are pretty similar to what we've seen in previous years, but it's important to set those reminders. The first thing is because a lot of these areas, both Central South America, Caribbean, Mexico, they are going to be receiving heavy traffic over the winter holidays. That's including Thanksgiving and then looking back into the later part of December and early January. Uh, a lot of these locations, just looking at last year, surpassed previous years as far as the traffic. I expect that to be even higher uh, this year, now that a lot of these regulations for different countries have kind of stabilized and made those entrance uh, abilities very clear. Uh, so as such, you want to make sure if you have any idea or any inkling that you may be going to any one of these uh, high traffic destinations, you want to get that parking in now. Uh, they have very limited parking, at, especially in the Caribbean, very limited parking and, of course, high demand. Outside of parking, you want to make sure that you request hotels, too, because those are also very limited and what they, uh, they have available. Um, uh, another thing to consider is that if your passengers haven't traveled in a while, they need to check their passports. You want to make sure that that validity uh, for a lot of these countries needs to be three to six months. If it's not, get those updates in as soon as possible. There's a lot of people going to apply for those new uh, passports. So it's, it's important to get that in now. And of course, if at all possible, avoid revisions because some of these locations may put you at the end of the list and you may lose what you have. All right, so back to one of our favorite topics, parking, 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 parking. <laughs> Plan ahead and parking. Um, all right, and then you had also mentioned that with this season that Asia Pacific, now that there's some glimmers of hope, could also be experiencing some uh, in peaks in traffic or at least be a little rusty due to being inactive. Uh, yes, the whole region has been shut down basically for the last two years. We are seeing signs of that opening with some of the countries I just touched on today. With that, I expect some traffic to be heading that way. So you have people that are wanting to go there for tourism purposes to countries such as Thailand, conduct business in countries such as Singapore. We're seeing those signs of opening from countries like Japan. So I expect to see a lot more traffic in the region. Some of those countries in that area are still shut down, but we're watching them closely because countries like Australia, though right now they're only permitting Australian vaccinated travelers to enter. I'm expecting that that will likely include non-Australian nationals, probably around the January, February timeframe. So I see that increasing. And also in the region, other high traffic locations like Mali um, have already announced for Victor Romeo Mike Mike, they're parking for the December and January timeframe for those holidays. They're already completely full. Well, all right, so good to note all positive signs, but definitely to keep in mind for planning. So back to what I know I keep repeating, but just since we're covering so much detail, you know, make sure you're looking in the blog and or subscribe to it for updates. And then don't forget as well, since we, you know, so many of our locations are on the ground and can offer insights into your specifics, the Universal Aviation website, you can connect directly with our locations and as well get information about their direct services. All right, so. On that note, Christine, we're going to let you catch your breath until we get to our questions. And then we're going to move into our U.S.-Mexico update with Adam. Hey, Adam, good to see you. And welcome back to the webinar stage. 
So lots of excitement, of course, this week. Uh, and uh, right now, due to those US entry rule changes and expanded access for vaccinated travelers into the country. So that new proclamation just went live November 8th. What are the big changes? Can you give us the big picture? Yeah, so uh, big news, something we were all waiting on, right? Uh, and uh, the first thing to note is that November 8th proclamation uh, takes the place of all previous proclamations. So all the proclamations going back the last 19 months uh, that are all suspended, that had the suspended regions and were basically built around regional approaches for hotspots. Uh, those are all null and void. Uh, so we're no longer looking at travel histories, 14 day travel histories for return to the United States. Uh, and we'll come back to this uh, uh, again, but also all national interest exceptions uh, approved to help navigate those suspended regions or, or travelers coming from those regions are also uh, null and void and have been canceled. Uh, so there are a few exemptions that are out there, obviously, for our U.S. citizens. Uh, and I think that's uh, where we'll start first, right? Exactly. Yes. I would like for you, if you can, to let's really start there. What are the specifics and the impacts to U.S. citizens? Yeah, and so uh, as we move away from this regional approach, this is really about the traveler now, and uh, the, and more importantly, the traveler's vaccination status. Uh, so U.S. citizens who are vaccinated uh, still require to test. So that's very, very important. Vaccinated, unvaccinated, U.S., uh, non-U.S., everybody still is required to test in, in addition to their vaccination status. Uh, if you're U.S. and vaxxed, uh, you require or you have still have to have a test result within three days uh, prior to coming to the United States and then present or, or fill out an attestation uh, as well. And, and really the attestation is important here. The attestation has uh, definitely changed and we'll post that uh, so that everybody has the newest, uh, but the, the attestation is doing the heavy lifting for the operator and the carrier. So that's uh, what's really important is that this is not something that's coming up on landing rights with US Customs not something that we're hearing any feedback about customs or anybody asking for these attestations on arrival. Uh, so since we moved away from a regional approach to a uh, traveler centric approach, really the, the onus is 100% on the, the operator uh, and the carrier, but uh, an attestation uh, is required. So uh, also, so on your US citizens who are not vaccinated, uh, when you're not vaccinated, uh, you can still come, but that tightens your windows. So you have to uh, test within 24 hours uh, of coming to the United States instead of uh, within three days. So that makes things a little bit more complicated. And then you'll be on your attestation, you'll be making uh, some other statements uh, regarding self-isolation uh, and things like that, uh, a commitment to retest after arrival from in in international travel. But remember when it comes to uh, US citizens, the language on those attestations is uh, more about recommendations uh, to things that they that the CDC says a U.S. citizen should do upon returning to the country. Got it. Okay. And then can you dig into those requirements now for the foreign nationals coming into the U.S.? Yeah. So our non-U.S. citizens uh, still proof of vaccination. Uh, but if you are vaccinated, uh, testing within three days, so within 72 hours, uh, and again, your attestation uh, form to be uh, reviewed pre-boarding. Uh, if you are not vaccinated and a non-US citizen, there are very few exemptions. Uh, so there are still uh, some exemptions out there, humanitarian, uh, obviously your crew exemptions, active crew exemptions, deadheading crew, those kind of things are still in place. Uh, your your pre-departure testing, like I said, is uh, much tighter. And then post-arrival, you would need a uh, viral test within three to five days. You have to commit to a self-quarantine for seven days. If you're going to be staying in the country for up to 60 days, you have to commit to becoming vaccinated within that time. Uh, so uh, there is a much, all of that again is controlled through the attestation. You're not making those uh, claims to a CDC officer or, or CDC representative. There's not an app or anywhere that we can load that information, but you are detailing uh, in your attestation uh, that that has been done uh, and that you have made those uh, arrangements. Got it. All right, and you mentioned you'll be able to make those attestation forms available and that will be coming up for uh, on a per trip basis? Correct, you, you provide an attestation for every arrival back into the United States. Got it, all right. All right, so good news and very welcome. Um, but can you also give us an update on Mexico? Uh, it's surely going to be a popular destination for the holidays. So what's new with that region? 
So as far as air travel, since we haven't had a really highly restricted uh, kind of uh, environment to work with before, nothing has changed in the air environment. But we, where we did have restrictions uh, across the land border, we have seen that lifted. So that's really good news again for uh, you know uh, the economy, travelers moving again. But even at that land border, you still have to provide a proof of vaccination, uh, uh, especially if you're a non-U.S. citizen. Got it. Okay. Well, same for you, Adam. I'm going to let you gather your thoughts while we collect the questions from the group. So we'll see you again in the Q&A. Thank you. And that gives us a chance to get that Canada update from our guest, Anthony. So welcome, Anthony. So good to have you back. So last time you were with us was all the way back in March. Feels like a bit of a lifetime ago at this point. Oh, so much keeps changing and yet somehow stays the same. We're, but we are looking at some positive news, and I know you have uh, a lot to share with us about the latest for Canada, and we are very lucky to have you to do that directly. Thank you for sharing your specific insights and your representation of CBA and really giving us that insider's perspective. So um, can you start us off then with that overview of the current state of things? Can you help us understand the changes that are happening, the impact to operations, and those critical dates that you mentioned? Perfect. Thanks, Annabelle. And to the team at Universal and to those in attendance, thanks for uh, both the invitation and the time that you're taking today. Uh, what I wanted to do is go through basically about 10 minutes of what's changed with this thing called a vaccine mandate, or what's changed with CBSA, sort of those entry procedures. And I know like a lot of you and, and from the details that have come today, a lot of these regulations feel like that ready, fire, then aim kind of aspect. Uh, so to start with the Canada approach, I want to start with a Google map. Um, and the first thing I want to unpack is, is this idea of the international ports that are available for operators to use. So we're going to click on this layer two. This map will be made available either in the chat or after the fact, but it's something that the association developed to help kind of visualize what these changes were. So to start first with the CBSA entry procedures, uh, right now there are 10 international airports of entry. As of the 30th of November, there are going to be eight more added. So you can see that it's St. John's, Hamilton, Waterloo, Regina, Saskatoon, Kelowna, Abbotsford, and Victoria. Those airports will be added as of November 30th for your international entry. So you're gonna to start to see that map here. Layer three is something that I wanna highlight for some of the operators that these are airports that are currently staffed by CBSA officials, but are not as a result of these COVID uh, uh, entry restrictions available uh, for use. So you see places like Windsor, Ontario, London, Ontario, these are popular. We have some of our provinces here that even the uh, provincial capital of New Brunswick, Fredericton is not available. Business hubs like St. John, Moncton, uh, the, the, the capital of a place called Prince Edward Island, popular for a lot of folks, uh, Charlottetown is not available. So this list highlights what I would suggest is still the opportunity to go. The association is pushing very hard that as a result of November 30th, the date that you'll hear again when we talk about the vaccine mandate, we want to see all available, so all staffed CBSA ports of entry, all of the airports that you see highlighted here that are not effectively green or purple, for lack of a better term, every yellow airport should be open then uh, for international arrivals. That's the way uh, we want to highlight it. I do need to highlight, of course, with CBSA, uh, your use of ArriveCAN. Whether it's through the app or online, I uh, definitely want to share that uh, it will become the future of the interactions that you have with CBSA. So effectively, your passengers are uploading their vaccine. Uh, principally, the point of it is they're uploading their vaccine information. Um, but I think what's really kind of interesting is that future steps, the way CBSA will take on after we can kind of get this thing COVID behind us, uh, in conversations with CBSA, the way they view that app and more specifically how it'll interface with their agents across the country, it's there's some pretty exciting um, ideas that, that have been proposed that we've advocate, advocated for and that they're considering. So everything from, uh, you're familiar with, of course, CanPass, 
but the ability to simplify your entry. So as your passengers uh, upload their information, purpose of stay, uh, length, uh, all that, uh, it'll become easier for you to transmit that information to CBSA. It'll be easier for them to do the work they need to do on the back end to validate that person's entry uh, and ultimately approve your flight. So things are looking really good, but a reminder that for those entries, arrive can is critical. So let's think about this vaccine mandate component. I'll eliminate some of these uh, other layers. So the key dates, uh, dates that you might have heard, at least with operations to Canada, October 30th, November 15th, and November 30th. But as an international operator, and that's kind of the lens that I want to share here today, really there's, there's two of those dates that I think are things that you want to watch, uh, November 15th and November 30th. And we're going to unpack that, but I just want you to leave you with this, that when you're thinking of Canada and if you're thinking of this vaccine mandate, the question you need to ask yourself is, what airport am I departing from? That's a critical question. Why? Because on layer one, this primary layer, this is what we call the schedule two airports. Now, this is defined in this interim order. Uh, the specific number is 43. But the reason why I want to share this uh, link and this layer for you is that if you are departing from one of these listed airports, let's zoom in on a province just for uh, some context. If you're departing, say, from Vancouver, if from Abbotsford, Victoria, Penticton, Kelowna, these areas, these blue dots, if you will, think of it as anything within that airport fence, there's likely going to be a vaccine mandate uh, application to you. Let's first think about the crews. Crews are exempt, but let's just start there. Now you're exempt till November 30th. I think that you're gonna see an exemption beyond that. Uh, and here's why. Canada still does not recognize any vaccines beyond uh, Moderna, Pfizer, Janssen, AstraZeneca. If you've got like um, Sinovax or the Russian Sputnik, so a lot of like international crews, here's, here's the litmus test. You'll, be, you'll know that I think there's going to be a change if Canada approves the recognition of other global vaccines. If that doesn't happen, I don't think you're going to see any changes to the crew, but that's still a decision that, it, that is being reviewed, let's say. So for crew, again, that reminder, foreign crew in that active duty uh, are exempt from any of these requirements to right now, November 30th. I expect it'll go beyond that. Your passengers, however, here's what's changed. Uh, if you're departing from one of these airports, you're validating either from October 30th to November 30th, you're doing one of two things. You're either checking, are they vaccinated or do they have a valid COVID molecular test? Uh, now, a reminder in Canada, there is some differences. A rapid antigen test does not qualify. Uh, PCR, RT lamp, or the NAT style molecular tests, those qualify. So, you know, when you're, when you think of it as an international operator and you're coming to Canada, uh, the, the way to think of it first is that not much has actually changed. If you're an international operator coming to Canada, it's likely that your passengers are vaccinated. Why? Because they avoid the quarantine. They avoid the day eight test. So it's a uh, really, it's a matter of convenience that an international operator, typically your passengers are going to be vaccinated. So I, I wouldn't stress that uh, the operations to Canada are the issue. The vaccine mandate is about uh, those departures from airports within Canada. And I thought the best way to kind of unpack this, and, and I want to appreciate the folks that took the time to write in some of the questions. So I'll tailor at least one of the answers uh, to a question that was posed. Let's imagine we're maybe a US operator, international operator, but for the purpose of the example, we're coming from the States and we wanted to go up into uh, to Canada. In particular, it was into the, the West Coast, it was Vancouver. Now, a reminder, of course, that... Uh, when you look at these note, the airports of entry right now, the only one that's available to you, if you're considering a trip between now and November 30th, so let's say the next 20 days, the only airport available you to land at to clear customs at is Vancouver. So that's something to think about. But after November 30th, you will be permitted to go to Victoria. You will be permitted to go to Abbotsford and Kelowna. So those are some of the, the, the Western provinces and some of those cities. But some interesting things happen when you are, are, are departing, say, within Canada. So perhaps your trip was to arrive in Vancouver. Maybe you're going to pick up a Canadian or two. You're, you're conducting some business. You want to fly around the country. Let's imagine a scenario where you've landed in Vancouver because it's before the, the 30th of November. This is the only place to clear. And you want to go up to, say, Kelowna. Well, what's interesting is that, remember I said that there are 
these schedule two airports where vaccine mandate actually applies. Well, there's also airports like all of the other airports that are not listed as schedule two that you can fly to. And if you go to those airports, the vaccine mandate doesn't apply. So in the case of this local example, we've departed from Vancouver. You have a choice, actually. You can go to Kelowna, and that's a schedule to a departure or airport. That would mean on your departure, passengers, you need to ensure that uh, you've checked either that they're fully vaccinated or that they've got a valid COVID molecular test to November 30th. After November 30th, basically, they've got to be fully vaccinated. But that's to depart from Kelowna. So in some unique circumstances, and again, you want to understand what the applicability is, what the exceptions are. This is an example of the exception. If you chose to go to Vernon and pick up some Canadians in this example, uh, this is not a Schedule 2 airport. Therefore, there is no requirement for you to check any of the above, whether they're fully vaccinated or they have a valid COVID molecular test. So hopefully you're still still with me there on, on the examples. But I want to highlight also Another case that could come up just so that you've got a peace of mind if you're an operator, and that is emergency operations. So let's say, like normal, perhaps you're, you're, you're going into Kelowna, and then on your way out, you experience some kind of weather diversion. And let's say it's down here uh, in Langley. If you arrive uh, uh, at Langley, again, it's not a Schedule 2 airport for departure, so there's no mandate or no requirement. But let's say you depart Langley and have an emergency diversion to an airport that is a Schedule 2. So let's say you departed Langley and oh, you had to turn around, you landed in Abbotsford. There, for emergency diversions, mechanical issues, this kind of thing, you basically have 24 hours, according to the regs, to get in and out without having to demonstrate any of that vaccine mandate requirements. So they have thought or contemplated about emergency use, and that's the way to think of it. So I think in summary, what I would say, again, can pass. Canada Customs, ArriveCan, the use of ArriveCan, whether the app or online, is critical. Not only now, but going forward, it will form the foundation of, of your interactions with the men and women at CBSA. Uh, as of the 30th of November, there are 18 airports to visit, um, and that's that's something to, to keep in mind, 10 airports to that point. Again, the reminder that vaccine mandates in Canada, the first question you want to ask yourself is, what airport am I departing from? If I am departing from a Schedule 2 airport, those blue dots that have been identified on this Google map layer all across the country, then you're within the airport fence. The airport has a vaccine mandate. Therefore, there is the possibility you have to validate that your passengers, uh, again, between October 30th and November 30th, either they're vaccinated or they have a valid COVID-19 molecular test after the 30th of November, departing from one of those Schedule 2 airports. Basically, everybody needs to be vaccinated. Um, And reminder again that crews, uh, I expect the exemption not only uh, till November 30th, your litmus test is if Canada opens up recognition of other global vaccines, potentially there'll be a requirement for crews, but with the international nature of of crew operations and without that sort of global recognition that those other vaccines exist, I expect that crews will remain exempt from the vaccine mandate requirements, regardless of what airport you're flying to. So I think that uh, at a high level, uh, hopefully answer some of the questions on CBSA vaccine mandate in Canada. So Annabelle, I'll turn it back to you. Awesome. And thank you, Anthony. Thank you in particular. I know that crew question is one that's going to be, <laughs> that we often get. So thank you for highlighting that in particular, because it is a big part of the equation for so many operators. All right. So same thing. We'll let Anthony get a very brief breath, because I know he is quite popular in our array of <laughs> of specialists for the upcoming questions. So I'm gonna get set up to start asking you those pre-submitted questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and add all of our speakers into the spotlight so that they're all on screen so we can go through this as quickly as possible. So uh, a big thank you uh, as well to Anthony, to all the speakers and to all of you who got your questions in in advance. Helps so much for the team to get prepared to answer them as completely as possible. But before I launch into those, in case you do have questions that you just brought along with you today, please drop those into the chat. Lewis is collecting them and we'll be happy to get to them at the very end of the session. So Lewis is standing by, keep him busy. 
Um, and don't forget that if you do have to drop off, uh, let's do a time check. It's about 1241 uh, Central. We're doing great on time based on my estimates, but I understand everyone's busy. Hopefully that means you're getting ready to fly. So with that in mind, if you need to drop off, we will have a recording of the session as well as the chat transcript available via a link in tomorrow's operational weekly email that goes out. So look for it there. Okay. So let's start with that. And Anthony, you are up first. So this is regarding uh, Part 91 corporate flight operations. Uh, so this question came from an operator saying, we plan on several trips from the US into Canada to drop off or pick up passengers at various airports using the private FBOs. And I think this was the source of some of your, your, uh, your example. Since crew members will not be staying in Canada, just fueling and leaving to re-enter US, will they need proof of vaccination? And that's where that foreign crew uh, application, so they will be exempt. Now, there is some comments, you know, and especially remember I, I used at the, the start this idea of ready, fire, then aim. You know, this is what we're talking about. There is on November 15th this idea that uh, Canadian crews, so this is not foreign air crews, but Canadian operators to access the restricted area of these Schedule 2 airports. I, I happened to glance at the question, so I thought to answer both. If you're a foreign crew member, I expect that it, you will be exempt from the requirement. That is the way it's drafted to November 30th. I think it'll still go beyond that as well. If you're a Canadian crew member, the rules are obviously a little bit different. Um, but that's why the importance of these airports is critical. You are still looking after your packs in that sense. The passengers themselves, you will still need to validate that they've got either vaccination, uh, full vaccination with approved Health Canada vaccines or a valid COVID-19 molecular test. Um, but what's unique is it's the airport that's looking for that. So you may expect from time to time, uh, departing from one of those FBOs that you're contemplating, that the airport authority, if it's one of those Schedule Two airports, may come by and say, hey, noticed you're walking out from the FBO to the airplane. Can you show me that uh, folks have either a, a negative or rather a valid COVID molecular test or they're fully vaccinated? That's the way to frame it, but foreign crews will be exempt from that. Great, thank you, Anthony. All right, Christine, I have one for you. Has there been any discussion uh, in the EU or the UK specifically, perhaps setting expiration dates for COVID vaccines? Uh, as of right now, I haven't seen any specific verbiage. Uh, we have seen some one or two countries that stipulate that time frame, but not in Europe. Uh, I do foresee that becoming an issue down the line. You're seeing some countries in Europe requiring certain persons to already get a booster shot. So uh, I fully expect that within the next six to nine months, we're going to see all that verbiage kind of outlined. Got it. And exactly. Uh, we do expect more there. Thanks. All right, Anthony, back to you. So uh, specifically, again, requirements for uh, vaccines for Part 91 pilots. It appears, this is the comment that you sent in, it appears as though they are still exempt. Is this correct? And literally back to what you just said on crew requirements. Uh, so back to those specific dates and the timing, right? It is. And, and the other thing I would say is that, you know, we, we want to watch what happens after November 30th. But something to think about is as well, you know, you're, if you're positioning to an aircraft and you're flying on a Canadian carrier, they are going to be asking those questions. So like everything, uh, operations across the globe, make sure that you've documented things, make sure that you can either have that interim order, demonstrate that you are, in fact, an active crew member flying uh, or, or, or going to pick up an airplane to, to go flying. Um, if you do that, then I think you're going you're to go a long way in terms of getting that approval, getting on board and moving it forward. Okay, Anthony, that's a good reminder. We haven't touched on that in a while, but that is true. Obviously, while we all operate in the private realm, you sometimes have to use commercial uh, as part of your overall overall operational profile. So don't forget that that is going to have to take place, uh, that those documents need to be in place. Good, good reminder. All right, Anthony, I believe I got another one for you. Uh, this one is specific. I think the concern is how this plays out in person with customs on the ground in Canada regarding the new processes uh, and everything moving rather quickly and nuances. So what does that direct engagement with custom officers on the ground look like in this intervening period? So the process overall is still the same. You're still effectively making two phone calls. The first call is, of course, before you leave, uh, let's say internationally, maybe it's the US, maybe it's somewhere across the globe. You're calling into CBSA to say, hey, I'm planning a trip. I'm coming to this airport at this time. and This is my FBO. Of course, you're considering one of the airports that are available for entry. Um, and then you're, you're, you're going to want to have that arrive can information. The best practice that we've been providing to members is as your passengers submit that arrive can data, they're provided with like a reference number. You can provide that to CBSA to help streamline some of that data entry process. But 
experience varies between officers in terms of their comfort level, just taking that receipt number. But you, you do the trip, you land, you're still going to have that second call, uh, that arrival call that says, hey, I've now arrived at this FBO at the time that we said. Uh, and really what's what's changed, of course, is that they're still going to either clear you by telephone if they feel that's appropriate, or they'll have officers meet you. Um, but you may expect from time to time, although we haven't seen it, they do like random uh, PCR tests. But what they are is a kit. It's not something that the uh, CBSA agents are doing. But they, they, they can on occasion provide uh, what they call a, a molecular self-test kit. Um, but to date, business aviation crews have not... Um, have not faced that. It's really the airline side that's really experienced it. But that's kind of the way you frame uh, CAN pass. But again, I, I would really highlight that interaction and the importance of arrive CAN to your interactions with CBSA. If that's done, it actually goes fairly smooth with the uh, the CBSA folks. Got it. Okay, good to note. And then another very specific Canadian scenario for you, Anthony. So this is a non-vaccinated Part 135 crew. Uh, it's a day trip arriving empty from the U.S., uh, into CYYJ or CYVR for passenger pickup with a quick turn, returning back to the U.S. and basically doing the reverse of that itinerary three weeks later. So the passengers are Canadian citizens, two of which are dual U.S. Canadian citizens, and the passengers are all fully vaccinated. Yeah, and that, that's the one kind of that I would highlight is is the 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 story that I tried to tell. So if you are First, I, the reason why I picked that one was that, you know, prior to November 30th, the only airport to consider in that example, in that question is Vancouver. After that, you can consider Victoria or Abbotsford, but foreign air crew would be exempt from the requirement to demonstrate their full vaccination status. Uh, you are departing then from a schedule to airport uh, and you're departing from that airport to go anywhere, whether it's in Canada or across the globe. So there would be that requirement, and you've already kind of thought of the the, the right components, which is the passengers, whoever they happen to be, uh, departing from one of those Schedule Two airports. You still need to validate: Are they fully vaxxed? Do they have a valid COVID molecular test? But in the question, it sounded like they were fully vaxxed. So in the end, you just got to make sure that they can show that, um, and then you've done your part uh, in the event that the airport comes by and, and comes looking for that information. Got it. All right, Anthony, we're going to let you take a rest for a second because I have a very important question for Adam that was pre-submitted. So I want to make sure we get to this. Adam, when is the long hair coming back? This super neat look you have going on. Uh, apparently your fans would like the rock and roll version of you back. So Yeah, that was a side effect of the pandemic. It's probably not, <laughs> not coming back. Not coming back. Okay, well, all fans, please stay tuned. Just Stay tuned for more, more there. Along with the Christmas tree, maybe Adam's hair will make a return appearance. All right. So I do have another question that came in, and I'm actually going to take this one for a change. So it does look like COVID testing as a requirement. This came in from an operator um, for international travel could be going away. So this we've actually heard from a couple of people is the question of, hey, vaccines are more highly accepted. Can we now start doing away with all this testing rigmarole? Uh, and then the second part of that question is, will more countries start to accept rapid antigen tests instead of PCR tests, kind of giving you know more opportunities and different, uh, different options there? So I'm going to tackle this one myself because I went ahead and talked to our experts at Cedars Labs. That's our partner that does our on-aircraft COVID testing program with our operators. So I got their insights specifically. So this turned out to be a, a hot topic for them because they have been getting these same questions. So here's the response. So Although a number of countries right now definitely allow uh, access with proof of vaccine, many are still requiring, as I mentioned up front, that additional COVID test, either upon or before arrival, upon arrival, sometimes a couple days after arrival. <laughs> and it's both sometimes PCR, sometimes antigen or different versions of the test can be subbed in. Uh, but there remains uncertainty on how well the vaccines, uh, and this is from the lab and the medical perspective, how well the vaccines are available and controlling the spread of COVID-19 more holistically. And so basically their, their advice is we should anticipate that country COVID testing requirements are going to continue to change rapidly and sometimes without notice. So today it could be one way back to the other. So what is it we always keep saying? Plan, plan again, and then check again. Uh, that's going to be the case when it comes to testing requirements, but essentially we don't see it changing from a 
lab perspective. Uh, that was their take on it. Europe is experiencing an uptick in cases in some regions as winter comes along. And then Asia, as Christine was covering, specifically good news on opening, but a lot of testing requirements there to go with the vaccine requirements. So keep the logistics in mind, and it is going to be unique for where you're going as well as who you're carrying in the plane. Um, and then we touched on this with a couple of places, but also that whole vaccine program cycle, like when the first vaccines were given to the early adopters and that so we're about to hit 2022 and that year long process is about to overlap. So it's quite possible that more and more locations, more countries are going to start requiring, hey, what's the validity date on your vaccine? So that we haven't seen a ton of that yet, but it could occur. So back to that additional layer along with the vaccine and COVID test requirements. So on that second half of the topic regarding PCR versus antigen and how much is one going to be favored over the other continually, it's going to be dealer's choice when it comes to the country and what they're going to accept. Uh, as so check and recheck requirements in that planning stage uh, and be sure that it fits the solutions that you're putting into place for your testing, fit your schedule, your itinerary, your passengers, risk profile, all of the above. So that's the update on the testing front. All right, Christine, I have another question for you. Uh, I did want to touch again on the Caymans. This came up in the pre-submitted questions. Uh, I know you touched on it in your report, but this is about flight crews specifically regarding vaccine requirements in the Caymans. So right now, crew are not permitted in the country. So they can come drop off passengers or pick up passengers and leave. They can't enter the FBO and therefore the airport itself. If they do, they will need to complete that mandatory quarantine for that length of time, which is eight days without exception to that rule. Moving forward after uh, November, or on November 20th and beyond, uh, we're still waiting to see what those regulations will be, but we have been advised that what's likely gonna happen is that in order for crew to enter quarantine free, uh, they will need to be uh, vaccinated and complete the online application the same way that passengers would, uh, including a, a pre-arrival COVID test. Got it. Thank you, Christine. So Anthony, uh, back to some digging into details for Canada. So this question was specifically interested in entry requirements for essential versus non-essential workforce. Um, they have property in Canada, and there was a specific concern about, hey, does it make a difference, essential, non-essential? Well, and the good thing now is that uh, the borders have opened in such a way that so long as you are uh, demonstrating again um, coming into Canada, you know, to avoid the quarantine, you're going to want that vaccine status. The question about the essential, non-essential, that'll be unique to the operation. But on balance, anyone can basically come into the country. You just need to validate that information. And by being fully vaccinated, you avoid the most onerous component, which is the quarantine. And then your freedom to move within the country, uh, again, schedule to. I noticed Lewis had posted the frequently asked questions. So again, to validate foreign air crews are exempt. It is answered directly there on question four within the document. Um, so your, your, your ability to move within the country uh, will really just be uh, you know, that new element will be departing from that schedule to the folks that are in the back. Can you, if asked by the airport authority in this case, because this is how the government of Canada has decided this, they've empowered the airport, that schedule to airport, to potentially validate that information. And of course, we're not going through, as we go through our FBOs, we're not going through any, as we call it here, CATSA a line. Um, so in the end, it's it's up to the operator in this case, just to make sure that is the case. But otherwise, you're, you're free to come into the country. And, and what we're seeing 99% of the time, frankly, is that people are vaccinated because it avoids all the other, let's call it hassle that came along with uh, travel without it. Got it. Okay, thank you for that. So I think that concludes our pre-submitted questions. Again, thanks for getting those in early. And Lewis, if you are ready, uh, I can hand it off to you to if we've got some questions for the group that came in live. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Annabelle. Um, Christine, I'm going to throw this one to you. It's about St. Martin. Um, the, the question was that they're hearing that there's going to be a lot of restrictive arrival and departure windows and limited parking, uh, particularly during the holidays, December 20th through uh, right after the new year, about around the 5th. Uh, what can you talk about that and what do we know? Uh, every year they do experience heavy traffic uh, around that time period. It's almost guaranteed that you're either going to see delays or uh, you're going to have issues that may divert you. Um, I've seen this year over year for St. Martin. I expect nothing different, um, especially that since it's a, a very 
uh, I guess, high in demand destination for passengers. Um, so you're going to want to be prepared for that, especially if you're doing 135 ops and you have crew duty limitations. That's going to be another consideration there. Thanks, Christine. Um, Anthony, we have a question, and if you already answered this, I apologize, but um, can you delineate between uh, crew vaccine requirements for private versus charter crew? Well, foreign crew, so really the for, for foreigners uh, into Canada, the question, if you're a foreign crew member, there right now isn't a requirement to have that vaccination uh, to November 30th. There is some nuance within Canada, but Basically, it's going to boil down to this. If you are departing, even as a Canadian, unlike the U.S., so, so as you guys uh, stood up on November 8th, an international requirement coming into the United States, you did not contemplate or consider a domestic requirement. So in Canada, the, the, think of it as if you are departing from within the fence of a Schedule II airport, Basically, you've got to be able to show uh, that vaccine or that COVID molecular test to November 30th. And after November 30th, it's really the only choice is you've got to be vaccinated. So that's a unique circumstance. And that's how Canadian operators are having to contend with flying from one of those scheduled two airports. And think of it as literally anything within the fence at those airports. That is, by definition, the restricted area. Uh, that's the best way to view it. Thanks, Anthony. Um, another one for you. Um, a deadhead crew flying via commercial airline to from Canada still exempt from PCR tests and vax? That is the case. And, and the hardest thing, uh, if you do it well, then you, you avoid the hardest issues, which is just documenting that this is, in fact, why you're there. Um, you know, I can tell you from CBSA interactions where they like to, to find is somebody declares that they're crew but is not actually crew because, you know, whatever. So the, the way to frame it is if you are in the process, that active duty, just make sure that you're able to show the information. Perhaps it's a trip itinerary. It's like, hey, this is my reg. I'm at this FBO. I'm picking up that airplane tomorrow. And there's my itinerary. If you have that kind of information prepared, then you you don't expect any issue um, from whether it's the airport or CATSA for screening if you're coming in. So that, that's the way to view that. Great. Thank you. Um, Annabelle, I think we Anthony covered the other questions, so I think we're, we're all caught up. All right. Well, let everyone have one more chance to ask any last minute questions or take you can take a look through the chat if anything came in. But while we are doing so, I want to thank our panelists, as always, I really appreciate your time and energy putting all of these details together. And again, I know we did cover quite a bit. <laughs> I say this every single time. So look for the details in that weekly email update, as well as subscribe to the blog if you don't already. It's a great and easy way to see the latest operational updates as we get them, because we do update that quite regularly. Um, so Annabelle, I did have one yes. question I think we oh, missed. Yeah, our, uh, go ahead. For, for Anthony, um, are Q readers test accepted into Canada? QR codes. Yeah. So the, that's an interesting thing that's developed like the smart health card network. So in Canada, um, pretty much all of the provinces now are, are adopting this QR code. And as a result, we're able to like put on, if you get an iPhone, you can put it into your wallet. Um, but I think that's one of the nuances for us operators, because you guys have that white CDC card. And unless, and I think it's a, like, if you, if you say had a vaccine at, I'll just pick on a company, but Walmart or Sam's club or something, because they've adopted that smart health network that allows you that access. And so really it, it's, it's, it's sort of like a global verification system. So right now Canadians uh, do have QR code compatible and it's in this smart health card network. Um, but you can still obviously show your, 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 CDC card that demonstrates your vaccination status, and that's obviously accepted. And I think that's that's a great point to mention there, the smart health cards. Countries like the Cayman Islands that um, I responded to uh, someone's question, they are only accepting uh, U.S. vaccinations that are part of that, smell, that smart health cards. Uh, there are certain states that do provide that ability to pull up a QR code, uh, such as New York, New Jersey, I think California is on it too, um, and also certain vendors. So as you mentioned, Walmart, Sam's Club, uh, you have the ability to get that vaccination there. You can pull up your records online with a QR code, and then you can also transfer that to certain apps like the Common Pass uh, that a lot of uh, Caribbean countries are accepting and that has that QR code. So that's that form of verifiable vaccination certificate. Got it. Good advice because the need for verification more and more 
uh, prevalent. Okay, so I think that wraps up for our questions and definitely for our time as well. So as a reminder to all of you that joined us today, this is our last Office Update webinar and meetup for 2021. Uh, I wanna wish you all a very safe, healthy and joyful holiday season from all of us here at Universal. Uh, while it's very exciting news that business aviation does look to have a bright future ahead in 2022, we all hope and pray. <laughs> I hope you do have time in the intervening period as the year ends to reflect on the here and now and on what's been important and what we're thankful for in the passing year. So by the way, uh, speaking of the new year, we do hope to see you again in early January for our next webinar. Do drop me a note at operationalinsight at univway.com if you plan to be at NBAA's Schedulers and Dispatchers Conference, January 18th to the 21st. That's taking place in San Diego this year. I would love to connect with you there if you're going to be on site. So thanks again to our guests and to all of you for joining in. We appreciate your time. Take care and bye for now.